Good morning, church. If you're in the lobby, why don't you come in and find a seat? We're going to get started. Why don't you guys stand with me? Our call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 135. It says this, For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and on earth, in the seas, all the deeps. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. This morning, we recognize that not everyone worships the one true God, but because we know him, we have come to worship him as he is on his terms. And we can take great joy in celebrating our God together because unlike those who worship the things of the world, our God is for us, his children. And he lavishes his love upon us. And today we're going to respond in celebration through song of all of God's blessings for those who believe in him for salvation. Amen. So let's do that now. But 
people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house we see in this passage that God calls his people to be his lights in a dark despairing world all too often instead of holding out the hope that we have we put it under a basket we do this for different reasons sometimes motivated by fear a lack of compassion or other things so let's now take a moment to acknowledge and confess the ways that we have attempted to hide our light rather than let it shine.
today is from Isaiah 59, 16. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no man to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. Church, the good news of the gospel for us this morning is that God knows that we are insufficient for the glorious task of drawing others into his goodness. So the prophet Isaiah tells us that God did not that God did do something about it. God sent his son to bring about his salvation. Even when we fail in mission, God is not thwarted by our disobedience. He will accomplish his salvation and has chosen to involve us in it. Let's continue to celebrate God's grace towards us now and soon.
Amen. If you would, go ahead and grab a seat. Good morning, church. Oh, come on. There, there we go. There we go. Uh, my name is John Fox. I'm one of the pastors here, and so good to be here with you today. We have uh, a table that you passed as you came in here. If you know what that table is, it's not for you, okay? It's not for you. Uh, if you're new with us, it's got some green bags, and that's just a token from us that we would love to pass on to you. We believe that um, it's really important to live the Christian life together, not on your own. And um, that's just a way of starting a conversation between you and us. Hopefully, it's got some more information in there about us as a church. And uh, we'd love to follow up with you uh, with that bag. And uh, also, if you carry that bag around, secrets out, now we know, okay? So we're going we're gonna to have an intentional conversation with you. But um, it's important to us as a church, and, and we'd love to get to know you. Uh, also, giving in generosity is really important to us as a church, so we talk about it often. And um, the reason for that is because we recognize that God has given to us more than we could ever give to Him. Uh, in fact, we have many Bible verses that talk to us about this, uh, that say that each one, each person should do as he has decided, talking about giving, in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion since God loves a cheerful giver. And in the Old Testament, when we read the Bible, what we see is that there is a actual number that applies to this. It's called the tithe, and it's 10%, more like 10.5%, can close to 11, if you want to be super accurate. Um, but we see in the New Testament, that is not the same. The tithe is not mentioned that way in the New Testament. Instead, um, because of the full revelation of Christ and what he has done for us, we see that 10% is not mentioned. Why? Because now it's how much can I give? And that's really the, the heart that we want to have as a church where we see God's generosity and we want to respond. So if you are new with us, there's no obligation to give. We just want you to come and enjoy worshiping with us uh, and, and being a part of God's family that way. If you're a regular a tender, if you're a member, we would love for you to give. That's how we operate as a church. I'd like to just con um, continue this part by praying together. So I invite you just join me in praying that God would use these gifts that we give, not to just like keep us going as a church, but as we'll see with the sermon, that these gifts can be multiplied beyond our wildest imaginations by the Lord's work. So let's do that together. Father, this morning as we come and we sing to you, we lift our voices as we proclaim that you are uh, our Savior, the, you're the one who matters most to us. God, that that would be something that is accurate, not just with our voices, but with our actions. And as we give, Lord, we ask that you would uh, bless our small efforts, regardless of how much money we have or how much that we give in the fullness of uh, the work of bringing people from death to life, what does money matter? Lord, so we ask that um, whatever we give, whatever that you have given to us, that that would go and, and transform people's lives by the message of the gospel and hope of life in your son. And it's his, in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, periodically as a church, we do talk about our uh, affiliation with Harbor Network. If you don't know, we are a Harbor Network church. What does that mean? Um, it means that we are a part of a network that really emphasizes church planting. And you may be thinking, well, have we planted a church? The answer is no, we have not yet planted a church. But it is something that we aspire to, and there are lots of church planning that works out there. There are lots of churches all in God's kingdom that are trying to do this, which, as you'll see in a second, is something that we really need. Uh, there's no need to be competitive about this, about sharing the gospel and planting churches. But something that's unique about Harbor Network that is also true of us as a church is we want to be able to do that in a, a sustainable and a healthy way. And so Harbor Network's mission is empowering God's people to launch, lead, and multiply thriving churches. 
our, our part in that is not just to plant as many churches as we can, just find people with a desire, send them out there, start a church. Our intention is to be um, more careful about this, to also look inward and say, is our church healthy enough in a place where we could plant? And um, is it in a, in a place where we have enough leaders and sustainable? We haven't been there as a church, but that's something, like I said, we aspire to. So Harbor Network is a network across the nation of churches that are like-minded in this way. We want to be a part of it because they launch, lead, and multiply thriving churches. It's not just about the initial go start a church. It's also the ongoing healthiness that's involved in church planting. And uh, here's some pictures of various churches around the nation, uh, Harbor churches. And it just recently, a few weeks ago, uh, we took our staff and a few other key leaders down to a recent gathering. Once a year, they have a uh, Harbor Summit where everybody goes to Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, we have a great time of teaching, worship, and, and breakouts and, and discussions. But Harbor Network is doing something different starting this year where they are officially doing regional gatherings. So rather than everyone going to Louisville, Kentucky, which is not too close to the uh, PNW, they're trying to break up into regions. And so that's something we did a few weeks ago. There's a staff team, some others. Um, and uh, similar to the summit, the big one, there's some teaching, great teaching that we had from Ronnie Martin. He's one of the main um, Harbor Network leaders and, uh, and also time of worship together. One of the main th benefits from Harbor Network, in my opinion, is friendship. Friendship is one of their main values. Uh, and I think everybody has figured out that friendship is really important in a post-2020 world uh, where friendship matters so much. We have a short video from Harbor I'd love for you to watch if you turn your attention to the screen. I am from the place I affectionately call the hood, the ghetto, the projects in Northwest Florida. I married a sweet Navy girl who led me to Christ. She got stationed here in Norfolk, Virginia. God began to prepare me for ministry and eventually calling me to plant a local church. One of the things that I've valued and, and appreciated about Four Oaks Church in Tallahassee is that our congregations allow us to reach different parts of the city. We are now three congregations. It was planted in 1990, so it had a, a start as a kind of pioneers with multiplication. We believe that things that are most valuable usually go slowly over the course of time. We want to do a few simple things well for decade after decade after decade, and then trust that God does things in the midst of all that. We are a church in the center of San Francisco in the Haight-Ashbury area. We moved here in 2014, and it hit me that it would be very easy for you to be born in San Francisco, to spend your whole life and die in San Francisco, and never hear the gospel in a meaningful way. And a lot of people who are kind of aimless, and so we just seek to be a home for them, spiritually and materially, for however long they're here. When you're in a city that's so transient, to have a church that has a regular rhythm of life together, that provides a sense of safety. I spent seven months in the southern section of Norfolk trying to plant an urban church with passion and zeal. I just didn't have the support. I didn't have the resources. I didn't have the coaching necessary. I knew I needed some people who understood me, who understood our context, who uh, were doing culturally relevant ministry that was faithful to the scriptures. And Harbor Network really stepped in and became our people, became our tribe, right? Became those folks who were constantly inviting us to experience God's grace and renewal from the word and the gospel. When you're starting a church, financial resources, that's big. And so to say, we're not just going to provide a one-time gift. We're going to make sure that you're resourced directly from the network. But there are generous churches that are saying, hey, we want to support you above and beyond what comes from the network just to make sure that you have what you need to flourish as a church. 
the major pillars that led us to want to partner with Harbor was a clarity of, of doctrine. And we wanted someone who would keep the things that we were most committed to at the forefront. If we had not had strategists, people from the network who had made many of the mistakes and had some successes, to come and keep mission at the front and to help us with figure out a model that would work, I don't know that our organization would have been healthy enough to continue planting the way that we've been able to plant. That press on the long haul and the, the soul care and health of pastors and leaders and the people of the church is a major DNA factor of the network and I think is it's one of its best assets. There have been unique seasons where we really needed support, particularly in our family life when we're really trying to discern if we should continue in church planting. And Harbor was gracious, helped us ask hard questions, answer those with us, just provided a lot of care. I receive a lot of care, a lot of encouragement, a lot of instruction from these other pastors who are doing the same thing that I'm trying to do, which is love people, build a church, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I wouldn't have that apart from Harbor. So that's a little bit about Harbor Network and our relationship with them. But what I haven't talked about is really the need. Talk about church planting. But there is a huge need for church planting. And I'll give you some uh, statistics here from the Pew Research Center about uh, churches and the need for church planting. Currently, there are 334 million people in the United States. That's a lot. 200 million are unchurched, making the U.S. the fourth largest unchurched nation in the world. That's not typically how we think about America. Uh, but for Bible-believing, for, for gospel-believing churches uh, to be reaching the world in which we live in North America here, um, we are the fourth largest unchurched nation. Out of that... Uh, currently, there are 324,000 Bible-believing Bible churches, and that roughly equates to one church for every 1,000 people in the U.S. right now. To keep that ratio, one church for every 1,000 people, there needs to be 400,000 churches by 2050 to keep up with population growth. That means that we need a net gain of 1,900 new churches per year. For the next 30 years. But in the past two years, twice as many churches have closed. So there's a tremendous need for church plants, not simply just to get more people out there, more churches out there, but what we see as our world is changing is that the amount of Bible believing, gospel preaching churches that are in America can't keep up with a population growth. So we need more and more church plants, and that is part of the heart behind Harbor. Again, it's not just like start them, send them, but we want to have ones that are sustainable, that are healthy and ongoing. And um, I'll go ahead and invite the scripture reader to come up and uh, read our scripture this morning. But this is so pertinent because in our current series, the Jonah series, we see this need for God's mission in the world. Yes, it's big right now, but it's, it's always been big, as we'll get to see through the message of Jonah this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Read with us together in your Bible as we read the first chapter of Jonah, verses 1 through 17. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amiti, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil come up, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and 
found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? And what is your country? And of whose people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I and I feel the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more temptuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more temptuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done it as planned to you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the man feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Thanks, Melissa. All right, good morning, church. How are we doing? Hopefully everyone got to get outside these last couple of days and enjoy the beautiful weather. Uh, my name is Reese. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I'm one of the pastors here at Sound City, and we are so thankful that you've joined us today, whether this is your first time or you've been coming for years and years. Uh, there's a lot of places you could be this morning, but you're here with us, so we're thankful for that. Uh, let's pray once more, and then we're going to jump in to the passage we just heard read. Father, I thank you for um, this chance that we have every week to come together and recognize that we need something more than just our own strength and our own selves to live this life that you've given us faithfully. Thank you for the body that we get to um, lock arms with. Thank you for the gift of worship through song, through the hearing of your word, through the taking of the elements, God. All of it we praise you and we're grateful for, and we pray that you would uh, meet us now, even in these next few minutes, as we learn from Jonah's story how you would have us to interact and relate to the world around us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, in high school, I played football for our team. And while I, I really enjoyed it, especially Friday nights when we got to play our games, uh, my least favorite part of the week was the morning after. Because uh, win or lose, we would have to go up to the field house the day after the game and watch video, watch film, from the night before, and for two hours, we would be there with the whole team, and the coaching staff would analyze and pick apart every single play and highlight, this is what you did well, and here's what you did not did, do well. And because uh, football in Texas is a really big deal, uh, they focus a lot more on the negatives. And even if the night before you made a mistake, but it was kind of in the corner and no one really saw it, uh, it was just a matter of time before you would get your, your lecture the next morning. And it was not a very pleasant experience. Uh, Coach Bird was the worst. I Occasionally, a couple times a year, I still have nightmares about him. Even to today, with he'd have his green laser pointer and he'd point at you and then he wouldn't say anything. He would just stare at you 
for an awkwardly long period of, of time with those little birdie eyes. He would just b- bear, you know, bore this hole into your soul. It was very unpleasant. Uh, and yet, it was probably the most helpful thing that we did as a team the entire week, especially when we uh, didn't win the game. We always learned more from our uh, failures than the times when we won, and we would just celebrate all the things we did great on the film. And I mention it this morning because as we look at Jonah chapter 1, once again, it's, it's a, a helpful approach to look at this passage almost like it's Jonah's game film in fulfilling the mission that God has given him. God, God has given him. Uh, like we said this past uh, Sunday, Jonah fails at almost every single point of the call that God puts on his uh, life, and yet there's a lot we can learn from his failures as the church as we seek to do the opposite. So as a, a quick review, in case you weren't here last Sunday when we kicked this series off in Jonah 1, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah to go and preach to the Ninevites, but instead of following God's command, Jonah gets on a boat to Tarshish, which is the exact opposite direction, and he runs away from God's mission. And yet God, like we said, is a God that runs after runaways. And so in his mercy, when Jonah takes off sprinting, God takes off sprinting after Jonah. He sends a storm to wake him up from his stupor. And then he sends a great fish to sweep him up and rescue him when he is at the uh, lowest point in his life. And while the the Jonah and God relationship in this chapter is the the major plot line of chapter 1, we're spending another week in this chapter because there's an important subplot between Jonah and the sailors that are on the boat he is running on. It's a part of the story that often gets overlooked and ignored sometimes, but I think it's extremely relevant for us today because it gives a window of how the people of God, how the church today is meant to relate to the world that is around us. Again, not by showing the positive way to do it, but the negative way. So we're going to look at Jonah's game film uh, one more time in Jonah chapter 1 and learn what we as the church must do if we are going to be effective in our mission to the world by doing the reverse of God's runaway prophet. And so if you have a Bible, uh, open it up to Jonah chapter 1. If you have a phone, whatever is your style, would love for you to follow along as we look one more time. And the first thing we're going to learn from this story is that for the church to be effective in reaching the world, we have to wake up to the cries of our neighbors. We have to wake up. Verse 4, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And what you have here is is at the beginning of the story, it really is a perfect picture of the human condition that all of us face in this world. Because whether you are religious or not, every single person faces storms, both external around us and internal. For the mariners on this ship, they're facing harsh winds, there's waves, rain is uh, pummeling down on them. In that external storm that they're facing, it begins to create internal uh, turmoil. We read that they're afraid, right? They're panicked. They're running around. They're, they're crying out. They are us. Because to live in this world is to live in a storm-battered boat. And the storms that we face, even as Christians, are the same storms that those who don't know the Lord face as well. We are in the same boat. So it could be a host of things, financial stress, mental uh, illness, struggles with depression or anxiety, war, famine, uh, poverty, injustice, sickness. All of us are facing one form of a storm 
or another. But the thing about storms is they do not discriminate based on your religious affiliation, what you do on Sunday morning. The only difference between Christians and non-Christians is that we have someone to cry out to in the midst of those storms that others don't. In verse 5, the storm is raging, and we're told that the sailors, they begin to yell out to their gods. Or they begin to cry for help. But then if you, back then, if you weren't a, a worshiper of Yahweh, then you, you didn't believe just in one God. You believed in a whole host of gods. And when you faced storms, you would call out to the God that you think was most likely able to help you through your situation. And so you can imagine these sailors, one of them is over here and he's, he's crying out to the God of the ocean. Another one's over here and he's crying out to the God of commerce. They're doing everything in their power to find relief. And even though today we might not be crying out to actual physical figurines, everyone, when they face storms, when the boat of life begins to rock, we do cry out to something. We call out to help for something we believe can begin to calm the ocean. And whatever that thing is, it's your God. You might not call it a God, but functionally that's what it is. You're looking at it to save you, to bring you some, of, some kind of relief. But it struck me, <clears throat> recently I was uh, walking around downtown Edmonds, which is a, a really fun part of town that our family has discovered. And uh, I couldn't help but notice, though, how many new age shops there are around downtown Edmonds. I walked past a, a metaphysical bookstore. Um, there were multiple shops that had crystals hanging uh, in their window, some kind of medallion. I saw flyers for psychics everywhere, and it's easy to walk around that kind of a place and kind of, you know, stick our nose up or, or judge those kinds of people. But what is that? It's the world crying out for some kind of relief. It's the sailors on the boat casting lots, right, trying to tap into some mysterious power to help them make sense of life. The world is crying out. Or you look at a, a culture of workaholism that is so pervasive in our country, right? people that are unable to step away from work, people that are even sacrificing their families at the altar of their career. We all know people like that. Sometimes we are those people, and it can be easy to say, how selfish. Why would you do it like that? Surely there's a better way. Do you say that, or do you look at people like that and say, they're crying? Right, they're, they're calling out for help, calling to the God of their career to, to take away a feeling of nothingness. They're looking for validation. Right, they're the sailors in verse 13. Rowing, it says, harder and harder, working themselves to the bone to try to find some kind of relief. See, church, the, the neighbors that we rub shoulders with, our coworkers, our family members, our friends, the, the neighbors whose trash we put our trash next to every single Monday morning for the, you know, the, the, the dumpster. Those people are calling out to their gods in some form or another for relief. They're facing the same storms, just like us. We just happen to know the one true God. But the question of this chapter is, as the world is crying... Are you awake to those cries, or are we sleeping through them, like Jonah is in the bottom of the boat? And in verse 5, we learn all this chaos is taking place, but it says, Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. A God's prophet, whose mission it was, to declare the words of God, could not care less about the plight of his neighbors. In fact, he's so indifferent, he's not just ignoring the sailors, he is sleeping through their cries. He's the only one on the whole ship that knows the God that can do something about these storms, and yet he is snoozing away, catching up on sleep, because he has separated himself from the world. All right, think about it, how is Jonah able to sleep through such a noisy situation? Well, because he's 
gone down into a very secluded and comfortable corner of this ship. He has removed himself from the world. And oftentimes, sometimes, this is what happens to us in the church too, right? The world might be sinking around us, but if we're not careful, if we're not intentional, it can be so tempting to find our little corner of the ship and never come back up on the deck around our neighbors. Jack S. Elul, who's a commentator on Jonah, he said this. He said, Jonah's sleep was a refusal to accept solidarity with the sailors. When all the world is in danger, the man who flees from the word of God seals himself off in his solitude, willing neither to see nor to hear anything of what others are doing. But the, the first reason that Jonah fails in his mission is that he was asleep to the cries of those that were right around him. And he only begins to wake up in verse 16. In verse 16, or verse 6, sorry, the captain seeks Jonah out and he says, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. And do you see the irony? It's not Jonah that goes up to the deck to find the sailors. It's the sailors that come down to find him. And when they find Jonah, they give him the, the speech that he needs to hear. Why are you sleeping? Why have you run away from us? Arise, you know the God who can actually save us. I know for me, just speaking honestly, even as I was studying this passage this week, the words of the captain here, these are the words that convicted me the most. Because I don't know about you, but if you can uh, relate at all, it can be very easy to fill all the free time that I have in my calendar with church-related activities and obligations. And even though each of those things might be right and good in and of themselves, the sum total of it all can often keep me from ever leaving my comfortable corner and going up on the deck of the world ship. And the words of this captain are a challenge to me. And if you can relate it all, it's a challenge to you to open our ears to the cries of those that are around us. Why are you sleeping? Arise. You know the God that we need. And if you're wondering, okay, well, what does that look like practically to, to wake up to the cries of the world? Well, I don't think it's that complicated. I think that it um, is simple, even though it is difficult. But it starts with simply making space in our lives to build friendships with those that don't know the Lord, who don't know that there's a God in heaven that they can cry out to in times of need. It just starts with presence. See, what might, might happen? We heard some compelling statistics about the state of the, the church in America, but what might happen if every follower of Jesus, instead of maybe filling their calendar with three church events in the evenings every week, what if we committed just to two church events, and then that extra time, we invited our neighbor over for dinner. Or we went over to their house. Or we grabbed coffee with that coworker who was facing something difficult. Right? What if every one of us, whenever we saw our, our neighbor doing yard work in the front yard, instead of going over to the blinds and closing the blinds, you know, so that you can maintain your privacy and they don't look at you and awkwardly look back. Have you ever done that before? Confession, I've done that before. What if instead of that... You saw the neighbor and you said, okay, I'm going to go check my mail. And you went out to the mailbox and you asked that neighbor a couple questions and see if there was a friendship that could be built there. All right, what if we made time for those who don't know the Lord? And when you do that, when you begin to be present, it will not be long before you begin to start hearing their pain points. It won't be long before you start to hear little cries of their life and you will realize, oh, the storms that you are facing are not all that different from my storms. We're in the exact same boat. I can relate to that. You're not as mysterious as I thought that you were. I just happen to know the one God that can actually do something about it. So that's the first thing we learn here. To be effective in mission, we must not be like Jonah. We must be awake to the cries of our neighbors. But then 
Second, once we are awake, there's another mistake that we have to avoid. Uh, In verse 6, the captain wakes Jonah up and he says, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And so what does Jonah do? Does he cry out to his God? No, he's silent. He's on the deck finally, but he still refuses to reach out like a true prophet should. And we know that because in the next verse, the, he, the sailors begin to cast lots. Right? They drag Jonah up for help, but he's a steel trap. And so they have to resort to other means to try to make sense of what is going on. So they cast lots. The lot falls on Jonah, of course. And so they go back to him once again, and they ask him a barrage of questions. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? Now, notice, uh, each of these four questions, all of them are questions about Jonah's identity. They want to know who Jonah is at his most fundamental core level. But look carefully at how Jonah responds. He says, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea in the dry ground. He answers all of their questions except one question. What is your occupation? He doesn't answer that question. See, Jonah is very comfortable living out in the world as a spiritual person. He's comfortable being open with his faith, if you will, but he is not comfortable being a prophet. He says, I fear the Lord. He claims that part of our identity. He doesn't hesitate, but he ignores the other part of his identity. He's fine being known as someone that knows God, but not fine being someone whose job it is to help other people know God. And if we're honest, once again, that's a temptation that all of us face. I know for me, for, for much of my walk with Jesus, if you were to ask me, okay, Reese, as a Christian, who are you? I would have said, In Christ, I am a beloved son of God, full stop. And that would have been true. It's still true. That's gloriously true. And yet, a a few years ago, I had a friend that began to push back a little bit and say, that is true, Reese, but I actually think it is incomplete. That's only half of your answer. Because in 2 Corinthians 5 and in many other places, Paul says to a church, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us to the world. Now notice the language. Paul doesn't say, you are a child of God who occasionally gets asked to do ambassadorial things. No, he says, you are an ambassador, right? That's identity language. You are, not that's just something that you do. It's identity language. Talk, because when we come to Jesus, at the same time, Jesus says, you are now mine. Jesus says, you are now also the world's. You are a servant. Both are true. If you are a follower of Christ, mission, which, okay, what is mission? Mission is the call of God on his people to serve the world in both word and deed. That's what mission is. It's the call to be a sent servant to the world, just like Jesus was. And if you follow him, mission is not just an activity. It is a part of your identity. It's not just something that we do occasionally a few times a year. It is who we are, whether we're living out that identity or not. In other words, I am not just a son of God. I am that, but I'm also a servant to the world. You're not just a daughter of the king. You are an ambassador of the kingdom, whether you're living it out again or not. And it's only when the church embraces both parts of that identity that we begin to be effective in mission to the world. Jonah only embraces one. We have to embrace both. Now, embracing it, that's not easy to do. Uh, In fact, if you say to the Lord, okay, I want to be an ambassador. I want to live as a servant. What will end up happening is that God will begin to send you to people who are very different than you. 
right? You'll find that you start having run-ins with people that don't believe what you believe. People that beforehand, maybe you even tried to avoid. People that you might not even want to be friends with outside of this call of God on your life. And when that happens, it's easy to say, okay, actually, never mind. I'll just be a son of God, but not so much a servant to the world. It's hard to embrace that part of our identity. Now, why? Why is that? Well, in verse uh, 9, I think we get a clue. Look back at how Jonah responds to the questions of these sailors. When they ask them their identity questions, he, he doesn't just fail to answer all of the questions. He answers them in different, a different order than they actually ask him. He answers their last question about his ethnicity at the very uh, beginning. He says, I am a Hebrew, before he says anything else. And I think the reason why, as you'll go on to learn later in the book, is that for Jonah, the group that he belonged to had become the most important thing about who he was. The thing that Jonah was most proud of in life was the fact that he was an Israelite and everybody else wasn't. And that is what happens. Anytime you make the core sense of your identity something that is based on your achievement, it makes you very exclusive, just like Jonah. Because, see, when we base our worth, the, the, the core thing you look to, your first sense of self, if that is not what God says about you, if it is anything that you have earned, one of the ways that you find validation from that thing is by comparing yourself to all the other people that don't have that thing. Right, we say, at least I'm not like them. I'm on the inside. I've figured this part of life out. And they over there, they're on the outside. And that difference makes me feel significant. And when we do that, when we divide the world into us's and them, mission always suffers. See, if, you're, if your wealth is your identity, if, if that's the thing that gives you a sense of Meaning, then you'll always look down on the poor. Or if your ethnicity is your identity, you'll always be suspicious of people of other cultures. If your political affiliation is your core identity, you won't be able to look at your neighbor who you think is going to you know, vote differently than you in the upcoming election. Anytime our identity is based on a comparison between us and them, we become exclusionary. And it's very hard to minister to people that you have put on the outside of that circle. That's Jonah's problem here. And it's one problem, not the only, that makes it hard to embrace all that God has called us to do. All right, so what is the solution to that kind of us versus them living? Well, in the Lord of the Rings, which has a solution for almost all of life's problems, <laughs> the character Gimli, the dwarf, uh, he doesn't get along with the elves. Right? He has great animosity toward the whole elvish race root, rooted in a very long and complicated history. But there's a part in the, the story when Gimli comes to the land of Lorien where the elf queen Galadriel rules. And there's a moment in the story when Gimli, of all people, is invited to come and stand in the courts of the queen. And so he goes Reluctantly, he's weary, he's tired, he has suspicion in his heart. But when he stands before her, she begins to speak words of kindness to Gimli. Words of encouragement to this dwarf in his own language that no one else knows in all of Middle Earth. And it says the dwarf, hearing the names given in his own ancient tongue, looked up and he met her eyes. And it seemed to him that he looked suddenly into the heart of an enemy, but saw there love and understanding. Wonder came into his face, and then he smiled in answer. Yet more fair is the land of Lorien, and the Lady Galadriel is above all the jewels that lie beneath the earth. And from that point on in the story, Gimli's heart begins to change towards this group that he had before pushed to the side and actually begins to become best friends with Legolas the elf. Now, what happened to Gimli? Here's what happened. He stood before the most precious thing in all of Middle-earth, 
And that other looked at him, not with judgment, but with kindness and love and affection. And when that happened, it began to melt away all the petty ways that Gimli had been trying to form an identity for himself by dividing the world up into us's versus them. And if one look from Galadriel did that for him, how much more the gaze of Jesus upon our life. When you realize as a Christian that the most precious being, not just in Middle Earth, but in the entire universe, has looked at you and said, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter, and you I am well pleased. When that love sinks into your heart, it makes you throw away all the petty ways you're trying to form an identity based off your performance, and it makes you free to love people that are different than you, and you become a servant. That's how you do it. That's the only way to embrace your full identity in a world of exclusivity is to see the eyes of Jesus looking at you with pleasure. So what have we learned? Instead of sleeping through the cries of the world, we have to wake up, come out of the bottom of the ship onto the deck. Instead of rejecting part of our identity, we have to embrace it all because of what Jesus has embraced in us. But then the last thing we learn from Jonah here is that we also must be willing to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of other people. The sailors, they try everything they know to escape the storm for 10 whole verses, but the storm only gets more and more tempestuous. Isn't that a fun word to say? Tempestuous. I was thinking about that during first service. All right, that does not advance the sermon at all. But now you know how to say the word. It grows more and more violent until Jonah finally says, pick me up, hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know that it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Now, like we said last Sunday, this is probably not a sudden burst of empathy from Jonah to these sailors. Likely he is so distraught in and of himself, he would rather die than to see the mercy of God go to the other, to go to the Ninevite. And so in verse 15, it says that the sailors, they listen to Jonah, they pick him up and hurl him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. For 10 verses, the world does everything they know in their power to take the storm away, but it is completely ineffective. In fact, the storm only gets worse and worse until there is a sacrifice. Right, Jonah's self-substitution, even though it was done with the utmost reluctance, actually settles the storm and brings deliverance. As soon as he hits the surface of the water, the storm around these men and within these men stops. And up till this point, the sailors, they've been using the generic name of God the whole time, Elohim. But when they see this sacrifice settle the tempest, they change to Yahweh. They begin to use the covenant name of their Lord, which is the Old Testament way of saying they got saved. Right? They came to know the Lord. They came to faith. Right? Jonah is arguably one of the worst missionaries in your entitled, entire Bible. And yet when he sacrifices, the mission of God begins to pick up traction. These sailors repent. And the principle that we see at work here is that for a mission to advance in the world, it always demands sacrifice. Sacrifice is the fuel of all real mission to our neighbors. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Because it takes sacrifice to slow down enough to engage your neighbor who's doing yard work or to actually talk to your local barista and ask them questions about their day, right? It takes sacrifice to say, I'm not just going to do service kinds of things occasionally. I'm going to be a servant. When I walk out the door in the morning, I'm going to say, I'm a beloved child of God who's been sent as a servant to the world. That always comes with the sacrifice of time and comfort and resources. Sacrifice is the cost of mission. As we say, 
day after day, week after week, year after year to the world, my life for your life. My comfort for your good. My time for your benefit. It's very hard to do. It's not easy. But we have to do it willingly. And so the question is, how? How do you do that? Because mission, unfortunately, I wish it was just, let's have a mission day and we'll see the whole neighborhood come to know the Lord. That's, I've never seen that happen. Mission is the result of year and year and year of selfless service. So where do you find the fuel to keep going? Well, you may have, may have noticed with this story in chapter 1 of Jonah is almost an exact parallel to the story of Jesus when he calms the sea in Mark chapter 4. In both accounts, think about it, there's a violent storm in both stories. And in both stories, there is a prophet who is sleeping through that storm, who will not be woken up until someone comes to the prophet and shakes him awake. Right in Mark 4, his disciples shake Jesus, and Jesus looks at the storm and he says, Peace be still, and we're learned that just like Jonah, the storm immediately ceases, and the people in the boat fear the Lord greatly, and they worship. It is an almost exact parallel between Jonah chapter 1, but there is one big exception to the story. In Jonah, the storm ceases when Jonah gets thrown into the waves, but in Jesus' story, Jesus just talks to the waves. He says, peace, be still. And if you were an astute reader of Mark, especially if you were a Jewish reader, you would be asking the question, where's the sacrifice? Right? Why the omission? Where's the substitute? And of course, the answer is that you have to keep reading to the end of the book of Mark. Because when you get to the end of Mark's account of the life of Jesus, there is a storm, and Jesus is thrown into that storm, on the cross. Not because of his sins, but because of our sins. Not reluctantly like Jonah, goes reluctantly into the sea, but gladly, willingly Christ throws himself into the storm for the joy for the joy that is set before him. Just like the sailors, we are on a storm-battered boat and nothing we do can get us to land. There's no amount of rowing. There's no amount of lot casting. There's no amount of identity formation in our own self to make us feel like we belong. It is futile. We're on the the way to the bottom of the sea. And so what does God do? God becomes Jonah. God comes down onto our stormy ship in the person of Jesus. And he says, throw me into the ocean so that you can go free. Throw me into the waves that you have caused because of your rebellion so that you can find safe harbor. I will die to pay for your sins. Throw me over. And into the crushing waves, Jesus goes. The storm in Jonah, the storm on the Sea of Galilee only subsides because Jesus came to be thrown into the sea. God could have stayed perched in the comforts of heaven, right, and watched the boat of our world sink. He could have stayed aloft and watched the boat of your life sink, but instead he left the safety of heaven and joined us on the deck. And if he did that for you, surely we can leave our comfortable, cozy life to go across the street and check our mail while our neighbor is doing yard work in the front. Right, if Jesus willingly went to the cross and was pummeled for our sins, then surely we can make time for that friend who's walking through something hard at our work or to meet with that family member and pray for them who doesn't know if they have any hope in this world as they cry out to their gods. Right? The sacrifice of Jesus, the one true Jonah, is both the, the pattern, he's the example for our life, But he's also the power for that kind of a life of mission. Without him, we will give up. Without him, we will will run out of fuel in the tank. That's where the power is. And so this week, as we 
go out into the world as we kind of leave the bottom of the boat and go up on the deck, if you will, the questions before us are, are will we have open ears? Will we be awake to the cries of our neighbors? And when we hear those cries, will we say, I hope someone else deals with that. Or we say, or will we say, oh, I'm a servant. That's who I am. We can't meet every cry, but you can probably meet some cry. Will we live like that, like that empowered by the gospel, empowered by the example of our Savior? That's my, that's my hope for my life. That's how I want to grow. That's my hope for us as a church, is that we will not be found to be like Jonah, where the ca- captain has to come down and say, wake up. But that we will live awake to the needs of our world. Let's pray to that end. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this story of Jonah and how it's a challenge to us, Lord. How his failures ask us uh, the question, will we be asleep? Will we reject the call of God on our life? Will we be willing to say, my life for yours, to those people that have no life in your name? God, teach us to do that. And Lord, I do pray that the same mercy and sacrifice of Jesus um, that we have been given the role of taking to the world, that that same mercy and grace would, <clears throat> would comfort any heart here that might see their, their lack. But I pray that there would be no feelings of judgment or no feelings of guilt coming out of this time, that, <clears throat> that we would apply the gospel to our failures in this area, if there are there, and that we would be motivated for mission, not out of shame, but out of love, that we'd be moved into mission when we see how you have been thrown into the waves so that we could find safe harbor. We love you, Lord. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, church, every week we come to the Lord's table to remember what Jesus did for us, how he came down onto the boat and how he was willingly thrown into the waves uh, that we caused so that we could find life. And so as we prepare to take communion, we want to read this passage we read each week that Paul wrote to the church to help us get our hearts ready to come to the table. And so from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So at this point, I want to invite our our servers to come to the front. And as a reminder, this table is for anyone here who has cried out to Jesus to help, to save you from that which you could not save yourself from, your own sin and the consequences of it. But if you have never cried out to the Lord to be that kind of a Savior, we would uh, invite you to uh, stay seated and instead come and talk to someone about what that means if you're interested in learning more right after the service. We'll have a number of uh, team members that'll be at the front and we'd love to chat with you more about what that really means, what that looks like. So when we're dismissed here, you'll come through the middle aisles. You can grab the elements and then you can go back out around the outside. The wine is in the purple section of the tray and the juice is in the white section. So let me pray for this time once again and then you will be dismissed whenever You're ready. Take the time that you need, though. Lord, we, again, we thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. And as we enter into this moment of remembrance, Lord, help our hearts to remember and to to look upon uh, the greater Jonah who um, died so that we might live. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
in the valley oh God you're near in the quiet oh God you're near in the shadow oh God you're near at my breaking oh God you're near your name, oh God, you never leave my sight, your love stands for
Quick announcements before we send you on your way. Uh, we have a student game night coming up on April 19th. That's a Friday from 7 to 10 p.m. And so if you are a student or you know a student or parents of a student, put that on the calendar. It'll be a really great time. Love to see as many people out for that as we can. And second and last, we have our family gathering in Potluck coming up in two Sundays from today. If you're newer to the church, this is something we do a couple of times a year where we come together, we, we stick around after second service, we have a really good potluck, and then over that meal we share a little bit about what God has been doing and what we're prayerful that God will do moving into the future. And even as uh, this, this sermon, we've been talking about how we can have open ears to the needs of those around us and move towards uh, those needs. That's something of many that we want to be sharing corporately how we want to begin thinking about that uh, as a church. And so would love for you to be there and make that a priority, especially, certainly if you're a member. Um, we're about to read our benediction, but if you need prayer, we'll have a, a prayer team up here at the front that would love to pray over you or pray with you. Whether you have something big or nothing at all, you just want prayer, uh, that's what they are there for. So let's end, let's read our benediction, and then we will be on our way. This is from Matthew 
5, verse 16. Read this along with me. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So God, as we leave from this place, help us to go with our light shining instead of hiding that light, uh, because that's what you did for us. You came to us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Love you, church. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.